what about bacteria? Where did they come from, evolutionarily speaking? The evolutionists simply have no idea. They're, they're clueless as to how inanimate compounds can, through time and chance, become something that is alive and replicating and metabolizing. And we find that bacteria are far from being simple. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Creation Podcast, the show where we discuss the science that confirms scripture. I am, of course, your host, Trey, and I have with me today Dr. Frank Sherwin, ICR's zoologist and parasitologist. Correct. No. All right. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. It's always good to be here. Good, good. And uh, I see that you wore your most yellow shirt there today for go. the podcast, yeah. which is wonderful. <laughs> uh, so I want to talk to you about... Um, bad things. Okay. Are you, are you ready to talk about bad things? Uh, there's a lot of things here on this planet, uh, that can kill us and other living creatures. We're talking bacteria, pathogens, poison, viruses, etc. Um, but I want to kind of focus in on, on bacteria. Um, and I think that this is kind of an important thing to, t to discuss because really, uh, in the evolutionary worldview, uh, deadly things aren't an issue at all. I mean, right. it's a very death-driven worldview. It's just kind of a part of things. But uh, in the creationist worldview, you know, we we serve a loving God, um, and we know that death is not originally part of His plan. And so that was introduced, you know, in the fall, et cetera. So I, I would like to talk about where these deadly bacteria came from, what they do. Etc. So, what do we know? Deadly bacteria exist. Go for it. Well, that's true, Trey. We have lots and lots of bacteria in the environment. Uh, some estimate anywhere from 10 million to a bil billion types of bacteria. That's a lot. And of course, there's a lot there, and we don't really don't know because bacteria are so small, and they inhabit a a an ecosystem that can can be very very small as well. So, how many types of bacteria out there, species, well, there's there really untold millions. Yeah. And some would too say- Too many to count. Too many to count. Yeah. And so when you think about that, you think about how important bacteria are in our entire environment. And bacteria are the basis of what we call, like, for example, the food web, are the basis of breaking down plants and animals, for example. And so bacteria are a critical part of the ecosystem. Now, when we look at bacteria, and the pathogenic bacteria, that is the disease-causing bacteria, <laughs> there's less than 100 species of bacteria that are pathogenic. Really? A less than 100. Number. An wow. incredibly small number. This fits so well with the biblical creation model. We would expect that there wouldn't be an enormous number of bacteria that would be deleterious or right. pathogenic. And so it fits very well with the creation model that some of these bacteria due to mutations or something else would be uh, disease causing, but it would be a very small number. Okay. So we have a small number of deadly bacteria. Let's mm -hmm. let's talk about some of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I, it's kind of weird to say what's your favorite, uh, <laughs> yeah. but like let's let's list one or two what they do, how how damaging they are, etc. Well, for example, there's uh, Clostridium botulinum, and we've all heard of uh, botulinum type of uh, outbreaks that occur, yeah. and the botulinum toxin that is produced by the Clostridium. Uh, botulinum bacteria is extremely toxic. Very, very tiny amounts can kill statistically millions of people. Wow. And so what was this Clostridium botulinum bacteria before the fall? Well, it's hard to say. Of course, the Bible doesn't say, uh, it doesn't even mention bacteria. So we can only suggest as to what its original uh, function was. But according to scripture, it was either beneficial or at least neutral. But the Clostridium botulinum bacteria is quite unique. And uh, for example, then scientists have begun to do some research and find out, you know, if we were to dilute this toxin, this Clostridium toxin, uh, significantly, it could be injected into a person's uh, skin and get rid of, for example, crow's feet. And so that is, of course, is very, very important that the, the dilution effect is where it should be. But people were finding that you would get rid of crow's feet for months at a time, sometimes even longer. 
And but not the, have any bad effect otherwise? And, and have no bad effect. As okay. a matter of fact, there was an additional beneficial effect that nobody guessed, and that is some of these people that would get these micro-injections of this uh, clostridium uh, toxin, uh, they found out that they didn't have their migraine headaches anymore. And so now this diluted clostridium toxin bacterium exudate, as it will, was now you is now being used to treat some forms of migraine head, headaches. Wow. So that's kind of neat. That's why it's one of my favorites. Okay. Uh, do you have a second favorite? Well, a second favorite would be, for example, Microbacterium leprae, which of course causes leprosy. Okay. And leprosy is not as devastating as it once was because of the uh, uh, medical technology that has increased. But in biblical times, of course, we find that people were separated out due to uh, leprosy, mm -hmm. or today in the 21st century, we call it Hansen's disease. And so um, this particular type of bacterial infection, as I say, is not as devastating as it once was. However, however, there is a type of mycobacterium that is, and that's mycobacterium uh, uh, tuberculosis. Okay. And tuberculosis is very devastating, unfortunately, particularly in third world equatorial regions. In 2019, for example, 1.4 million people, most of them children, uh, died due to the um, tuberculosis. Right. And so that is a, a very sad statistic from one of these 100 or less than 100 type of pathogenic bacteria. Okay. Uh, before we get into what like uh, the evolutionists say about bacteria, I just kind of want to think about, I, I think about things like, oh, the Black Death or something like that where uh, a lot of people died for a particular time period and then all of a sudden, maybe not even all of a sudden, but like now it's not a problem. You mentioned that with leprosy. I know that there's like medical reasons why we can uh, – like as medical technology increases, we don't have to worry about certain things as much, but like, are there any other reasons why something can be so deadly for such a short period of time? And then all of a sudden it's not anymore. Well, you know, that's one of the, the mysteries of, of medicine and, and technology is we were able to go back in time, as it were, to investigate how many people died of the Black Death, the mm -hmm. plague at that time. And it was millions, of course. And, and the entire populations in Europe were devastated by this. And it was relatively quick, not as quick as some people think. And it kind of waxed and waned mm -hmm. after the initial breakout. And then finally, is uh, just as as uh, suddenly as it appeared, we don't find it very much anymore. Now, the plague bacillus is uh, present in, for example, some species of bats, I believe. I, I'm not sure I'd have to review that. And very, very rarely will somebody come down with this uh, plague uh, uh, symptoms and all mm -hmm. that, but it's nothing, obviously, the way it was centuries ago. And so it's still a mystery. I think there's a lot of research and investigation, historical uh, research that is being done on this, and we really can't tell too much except that it looks like rats and the fleas that infect rats were uh, spreading this particular devastating disease. And fortunately, thank the Lord, it's, it's not as bad as it once was at all. Yeah. I wonder if, like, maybe the rats died out. I don't know. Yeah. Who knows? It's it's hard to say because the fleas and the rats are what we call vectors mm -hmm. of the bacterium. And then, you know, the, the, of course, it wasn't very clean in those days. And, and so there was, wasn't a lot of sanitation at all. And so right. there's a variety of reasons why. And I don't suppose they'll ever get down to the, to the nuts and bolts as to what exactly happened. Okay. Well, thank you for entertaining my question at the very <laughs> least. Uh, so evolutionists, when they look at these bacteria, um, where do they say they come, where do they say they came from? Uh, what is their purpose? Is there a purpose? I mean, what, what's going on there? Well, certainly we would say from a creation science perspective that bacteria have always been bacteria, just as people have always been people and dinosaurs have always been dinosaurs. And bacteria from a creation science perspective, as I mentioned earlier, is a very, very critical part of the, the uh, entire uh, ecosystem of mm -hmm. the planet. Bacteria right down there at the bottom, they are breaking down 
uh, organic compounds and returning these organic compounds uh, to the soil. And then you get this uh, nutrients that are in the soil, particularly the element nitrogen. And that's very, very important. And so bacteria play a critical, critical part in uh, the ecosystem and the soil's uh, strengths, as it were. Right. And now, what about bacteria? Where did they come from, evolutionarily speaking? The evolutionists simply have no idea. They're, they're clueless as to how inanimate compounds can, through time and chance, become something that is alive and replicating and metabolizing. And we find that bacteria are far from being simple. Uh, years ago, I wrote an article about how complex bacteria are. Now, today in the 21st century, we understand that bacteria are insanely complex. Uh, and uh, they're finding more and more uh, discoveries regarding bacteria uh, physiology and all. And so we, are, we would look at bacteria and say this is a wonder of God's creation. But of course, evolutionists with their worldview cannot say that. Because they are like one of the smallest organisms, right? And so from an evolutionary perspective, they would be considered simple, right? Right, exactly. And it's the mindset of simple to complex. And, you know, a bacterium is simple and a blue whale is complex. Mm -hmm. I used to teach us when I taught in Florida, I would teach my students that there is no difference between the physiology and the complexity of a bacterium, including the famous ro rotary flagellum. Mm -hmm and a blue whale with all the physiological processes that are occurring in the blue whale. The blue whale is simply a whole lot bigger, obviously, than the bacterium. But when it comes to life processes, they are equally sophisticated and detailed, especially, for example, bacteria that are able to reproduce. They reproduce by a process called binary fission. Uh, bacteria in our gut multiply, some would say, about every 20 minutes, which is unbelievably fast. Mm -hmm. And therefore, all of the DNA of the bacteria has to replicate, that is duplicate, within a 20-minute time span. <laughs> that means that the entire circular chromosome, and we don't have circular chromosomes in our uh, cells, our eukaryotic cells, but bacteria have what's called a circular chromosome, and it is supercoiled. So if you think about these phone cords back in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. I've seen some of those. Yes, yeah. <laughs> those phone cords. They are twisted and all that. Well, it's the same thing with the, the, the chromosome of a bacterium. It is highly, highly twisted. We call it supercoiling. In order to uncoil, to duplicate an exact copy of itself, you need a whole host of enzymes to do that. And it gets very, very complex very fast. I love to teach about that because it shows the student that God's creation, even from the minuscule, is amazingly sophisticated. Okay. Wow. So we have these incredibly complex bacteria. We see that, uh, I guess, from, from the creationist perspective, we see that they are necessary. So God put mm -hmm. them here for a purpose originally, and they are still for the most part, serving that purpose. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Okay. Uh, they, are, they are the basis, the foundation of uh, the ecosystems. And so, yes, they are doing a very critical work. Okay. So let's think about some of these deadly bacteria. We already talked about botulism a little bit. Uh, so some of these bacteria uh, you could have possibly at one point maybe had a more beneficial purpose. Have there been studies uh, that have been done that can show that? Well, we would certainly agree to that, that prior to God cursing the earth with weeds and thorns and thistles and my field of parasites mm -hmm. and, and probably mutations is when they showed up when God cursed the earth, uh, we would look at a bacteria as either having a neutral or perhaps even a beneficial effect. Uh, thinking about our, our our microbiome and our, our um, for example, in our gut, mm -hmm. uh, the accumulation of bacteria in the gut, 
we find that about 1% of the bacteria in our large intestine is something called Escherichia coli. Maybe a lot of people have heard of E. coli, e. coli and yeah. sometimes you have these devastating E. coli breakouts that occur in f meats that is not processed correctly. Uh, but E. coli in our large intestine uh, actually works to our benefit. It produces some of the B vitamins and vitamin K2, I believe. Uh, and that's part of uh, the ability of our body to clot blood. Now, vitamin K is not at what we call a clotting factor. There are 12 clotting factors, but vitamin K is very important for that. And so we have uh, E. coli, about 1% in our large intestine, that are doing a very uh, important work in, uh, for example, the synthesis or the making of B vitamins and also vitamin K. In return, they have, the bacteria have a place uh, where there's plenty of food and where there's a um, an ability for it to live mm. and to proliferate. And so we believe a lot of that was probably going on prior to God cursing the earth. Remember, there's only less than 100 bacteria that are truly pathogenic. And so when when God cursed the earth, maybe cursing the earth like that caused some of these mutations to occur, causing these bacteria to have a devastating uh, effect where they didn't have prior to the curse. Right. And so it's, it's interesting to me when we, we you were mentioning E. coli, it's, there is a place for it. Yes. But it's, when it's out of its place or when it's in, in, too, there's too much of it, then it can be problematic, right? That's correct, yeah. Okay. So um, are there any other uh, bacteria that you can think of off the top of your head that are kind well, of Well, like for that? example, we have uh, bacteria in our skin right now, special kinds of bacteria that uh, inhabit these niches, it's ecological niches within our skin. And it's very, very important that we have it there because if people, for one reason or another, have to take a lot of antibiotics, which kill bacteria, the good news is those antibiotics that are prescribed to that person would kill the pathogenic bacteria, the disease-causing bacterial infection that they have. The bad news is if they're taking a mega dose, we call a lot of it, then it also kills uh, the bacteria in the skin as well, as large as well as in the large intestine. Mm. That can cause problems. And so a physician, if they give mega doses of vitamins to their patient, will sometimes give them uh, or have them take uh, vitamin K shots okay. because all that bacteria is killed that would otherwise uh, synthesize vitamin K. So that's that's a good idea. But the problem is, for example, the bacteria in the skin would be killed. That opens up an ecological niche for fungus. Okay. And so the fungal spores move in there. They proliferate because there's no bacteria that we would usually prevent them or prohibit them from uh, getting a niche, a, 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 a toehold in the skin there. And people with fungal infections, unfortunately, by and large, have a, a friend for life. Because first of all, it's very difficult to uh, to determine if a person has a true fungal infection. And then number two, getting rid of it. Mm -hmm. Now, we have cells that are called eukaryotic cells. Fungal cells also are eukaryotic. So the traditional uh, uh, the, uh, drugs that would be used to kill bacteria don't work on the fungus because their structure are different than the than the um, the bacteria. And they're more similar to ours. Yeah, yeah. more similar. So, in other words, any drug that is used to kill the fungus, unfortunately, unfortunately, is does not do well for the person as well. And you just have to the balance. What are the benefits versus the, the shortcomings? Mm -hmm. And so um, that's it's something that we just never think of. But having the bacteria in our skin is a way of preventing fungal infections, as it were. Thank you. Uh, for now, we're going to take a quick aside. This is a related question, but it is time for our random science question of the day. Okay, are you ready? You, you yeah, hope. I'm all set. <laughs> You're all set. All right. So there's a lot of description of, of life in the Bible. And, mm -hmm. you know, it says life is in the blood, mm -hmm. uh, all that sort of stuff, um, you know, and it mentions you know, creatures with cloven hooves and creeping things, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, bacteria, uh, would it, would bacteria be considered life biblically? Uh, no, it would not. Okay. Uh, what we find is that when God on day three uh, uh, created the plants from the inanimate earth, 
plants were created, uh, the words that God uses to describe those plants are not ascribed to, for example, people or animals. Okay. And so plants uh, uh, grow and they flourish, and that is used for the plants, but not for people, not for animals. And so we would say that plants are not alive, and that includes bacteria, I would okay. say, uh, bacteria in the biblical sense. And so, for example, people like, to, you know, the critics of creation would say, oh, what about Adam and Eve? They're eating all these plants, they're killing, that's death before sin. No, it's not, because the Bible, is, I think, is very clear in describing what's alive biblically, animals and plants, uh, excuse me, animals and, and people versus plants which are not alive biblically. And so it's true. There was no, no true death prior to the fall. There's a difference between something that is living, I guess, biologically versus what is yeah. considered life or yeah. the breath of life or something. Right. Yeah. So in other words, plants have mechanisms. And I'm writing right. an article about some mechanisms that have just recently been discovered regarding plants. It's fascinating. But again, it's not that life process that God has reserved just for animals and people. Okay. Well, that was a less complex answer than I expected. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Thank you for uh, humoring me on that. Uh, so for now, we'll get back to the topic at hand. So do evolutionists have a reason for bacteria to exist from their point of view? Think... Think evolutionarily, like, why would bacteria evolve to do all the things that they do? Uh, why would some evolve to cause horrible things to happen, especially if the goal of life from an evolutionary perspective is just to reproduce? Why would there be, a, you know, something like that that would just cause massive amounts of death? Uh, go. Yeah. So uh, basically, evolutionists would look at bacteria as part of the ecosystem, just like creationists would. But evolutionists say, well, it just worked out that way, that bacteria evolved, and they don't know from what it evolved. Uh, bacteria have always been bacteria. And then they took up residence in, for example, soils and, and things such as that, and, and organic substrates. And, and so we have bacteria today, and uh, plants and people and animals depend on bacteria from what I just mentioned. So they would look at bacteria as just simply part of the ecosystem that evolved untold millions of years ago, at least 500 million or a half billion years ago. Mm. But uh, we, of course, would have a very different uh, explanation in that we would say God created bacteria as bacteria just thousands of years ago. Okay, that makes sense. Um so we want our viewers to be well-educated, and uh, this is something that I think that is important um, for our viewers as they go out and they defend uh, creationism uh, mm -hmm. against those from an evolutionary mindset. Are there any uh, what you would consider bad creationist arguments uh, that would be be centered around this topic? I use, for an example, like you hear sometimes like, oh, Dinosaurs weren't real. The bones were just planted by Satan in the yeah, earth. Yeah. So maybe not something so far out, but are there any bad creationist arguments when it comes to deadly bacteria? I can't think of any bad creationist arguments when it comes to, to pathogenic bacteria, except that they have to keep in mind that is part of the fall. And a lot of Christians are not quite well-versed on the results of the fall and what God did after the fall, which is to curse the earth right. with uh, the various uh, pathogenic bacteria that we, we find. And so in terms of bad creationist arguments, I, I really haven't heard of anything like okay. that. It is kind of a... a a very subset of a topic. You yeah, know. right. It's, it's not like, for example, the dinosaur right. bones and all that. So um, yeah, I'd have to think about that. Okay. So uh, overall, it, they do exist. So we can't mm -hmm. deny that the deadly bacteria exist. Yeah. Uh, but you're saying, you know, the fall, the curse, 
mutations, et cetera. That's where this came from. Exactly. Yeah. And, and again, without getting off topic too much, that's my field of parasites. Mm -hmm. And that parasites uh, look like they were either beneficial or at least neutral. And, and in my field, we call them free living parasites like worms and all that. And then when God cursed the earth, some of these worms, like my favorites called the acanthocephala, <laughs> the thorny headed worms, mm -hmm. uh, then began to infect vertebrates, uh, okay. fish, for example. And fortunately, uh, not people really. And so it's the same thing with the uh, the bacteria as well. Okay. So there is, whatever their purpose was, we know that, you know, God God designed it for good. And so, yes. okay. I, I do know that like I hear, maybe this is a little bit of an aside, you know, you hear things like, well, if God was so loving, then there wouldn't be these things. You hear that mostly from non non believers of like, right. you know, the proof of, you know, malaria or the black death proves that God doesn't love uh doesn't isn't loving. What what would you say to that? Well, certainly when people start saying that, they have no real handle on Christian theology, okay. biblical theology, which if you're talking about the creation, you must also address the corruption of the creation. That's Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, where the deceiver said to Eve, did God really say that? And then we have the fall of Adam and Eve, and then God cursed the earth. Mm -hmm. And when he cursed the earth, it doesn't go into detail except talking about weeds and thorns and thistles. And we would uh, piggyback that, if I can use that word, with things like parasites and mutations and deleterious bacteria, pathogenic bacteria. So in terms of God cursing the earth, yes, that I think that makes, makes sense. And God is a loving God. He loves us very much, but he's a righteous God. He's, uh, and um, so we would look at that situation and say, yes, uh, it's unfortunate what Adam and Eve did. We're reaping the whirlwind, as it were. Mm -hmm. And we can thank God that a Savior was sent, the Lord Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe. And uh, he is going, he will, uh, uh, he has forgiven us our sins, past, present, and future, if we receive him as our, our personal Savior. And that's the wonderful news of Christian theology. The bad news is creation, the fall, and the curse, but Jesus Christ came to make things right. And someday he's coming back again in power and in glory. And we look forward to that. Absolutely. And at that point, there will be no more deadly bacteria. That's right. right. <laughs> right. Uh, he will make all things new. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thank you so much for uh, being on the show. Um, before we close, do you have any other final thoughts when it comes to bacteria or anything like that? Uh, any interesting tidbits that you want well, to share? Well, one interesting tidbit would be in concerning the uh, the cholera bacterium. Now, cholera causes millions of deaths mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in centuries past, but there is a type of cholera bacterium that is not the devastating kind that causes a disease. This particular cholera bacterium is found in all places, <laughs> the Hawaiian bobtail squid. And this Hawaiian bobtail squid has a population of Vibrio uh, fisher bacteria, which are very close to the Vibrio cholera bacteria okay. that causes uh, cholera. So related. And, yeah, yeah. It's, it's related, Only and the only difference seems to be one mutation. One okay. amino acid is different. And yet, because of this one amino acid difference, this Vibrio fisheri, which is a beneficial bacterium living in this squid off the coast of Hawaii, is able to communicate with the squid in ways that we're just beginning to find out. And uh, it is a fascinating, fascinating relationship. Well, creation scientists are going, I wonder, I wonder if that's the same situation went on prior to the fall. Mm -hmm. Well, I read a quote from an evolutionist who teaches at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Here's what she had to say in regard to this Vibrio fisheri bacterium in the Hawaiian bobtail squid and that it com can communicate with squid. She said, and I quote, Maybe when we've been studying cholera pathogenesis, we've been studying an aspect of a normal conversation that's gone wrong, end quote. Well, there's a lot that can be said regarding that quote, but we think a lot of these pathogenic bacteria is due to a normal conversation that's gone wrong. Right. There's plenty of research to be done. We are called the Institute for Creation 
research. research. We're not the Institute for Creation Answers. And so we're investigating and researching this very, very fascinating field of what we call bacteriology or the study of bacteria. Cool. Well, that is super interesting. I, I kind of look forward to see where, where that, uh, that line of research goes. Uh, so thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you. So thank you. Absolutely. And thank you to all of our viewers and listeners for joining us. Uh, we hope that this wasn't too weird of an episode talking about deadly bacteria, but Hey, it's, it's real. It's out there. It's something to talk about. Uh, so we just encourage you to like comment, share, uh, and we really just want to get the truth out about our creator, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, so share this with all of your friends, uh, especially if they have an interest in deadly bacteria, uh, maybe don't be friends with them, but, uh, we'll see you next time on the creation podcast. <laughs>